Fortuna. In Howard Patch's in-depth study of Fortuna, he explains medieval man's conception of the goddess's dwelling as an island. Quote, the symbolic idea of the island in the accounts of fortune's home is clearly that of the remoteness and inaccessibility of the desired fortune. Patch goes on to reference accounts from Alonso de Insulis, Dante, and Vincent of Beauvoir, all of which focus on man's inability to control Fortuna and determine his own fate. Fortuna's island contrasts with innate human struggle. Quote, the island is not subject to storms of wind or snow, but perpetual spring rains, flowers bloom, and birds sing continually. While Fortuna revels in blissful isolation, Humanity, whom she controls with the spin of her wheel, trudges along at the mercy of her volatility. Quote, fortune en enjoys exalting and debasing mankind as a game. Shakespeare's depiction of Prospero's island in The Tempest, however, is structurally antithetical to the medieval formula for a mystical dwelling place. In fact, the framework Shakespeare works from seems set up to, to play off medieval ideas of man's relationship to Fortuna as opposed to the medieval convention of being able to, unable to access, much less control, Fortuna's island, Prospero becomes in the eyes of those he lords over, quote, some god of the island. Instead of a supernatural force systematically rendering man impotent, the deposed duke harnesses spirits that likewise have the power to control humans, a feat he is capable of because, quote, his art, magic, is of such power. Prospero abjures medieval man's servility to Fortuna and his unfailing acceptance of her fickle will. Shakespeare creates a new image of a Renaissance man who masters his surroundings by replacing Fortuna with his own magic, as Prospero both alienates and abuses others during his evolution. However, Prospero has not always been this domineering figure. As Duke of Milan, Prospero willfully abandoned his power to focus on, quote, the bettering of my mind through studying the art of magic. As would the medieval ascetic, Prospero formally chose not to utilize his free will for personal gain, but instead allowed his brother, Antonio, to go before him, a choice resulting in his exile and new ethical outlook. A seismic shift in his character is apparent early in the play, as he is described as, quote, a man composed of harshness, who is referred to by his subjects as masters throughout the play. After his change, caused apparently by his revulsion toward true disempowerment, others exist only to serve him. He deludes others with spectacles they do not understand, spectacles which he designs in secrecy, much like the Christian notion of God directing providence, fortune, and faith. Also reminiscent of the divine chain of causation, the spirits Prospero harnesses with magic have the potential to dole out grief rather than good fortune. As aloof master of the island, Prospero summons Ariel and the other spirits whom his will controls. These mystical beings then perform his bidding by acting upon humans like the shipwrecked nobles. Ariel calls himself and his lesser spirits, quote, ministers of fate, making Prospero, his master, the ultimate arbiter of human fate. A satirical exaggeration on Shakespeare's part, no doubt intended to criticize the abuse of power among figures of state. John Hunt's socio-political scholarship shows Prospero fits the category of Renaissance master, or one who measures his successes by ownership and power over others. Quote, what the Tempest does consistently represent is a world founded on the idea of mastery, a world where Prospero achieves, within the confines of his island, supreme mastery, making slaves even of those who are accustomed to rule. However, Prospero's social order in which magic subsumes Fortuna's role and the way in which even white magic causes him to become, quote, a tyrant, a sorcerer, wielding ill fortunes for all but himself, are aspects of the Tempest that have received little attention. Hunt says, quote, Renaissance man gave himself the authority to make the universe over in his own image, meaning this early modern man saw himself less at the mercy of Fortuna divine and more in control of his own destiny which allowed him to use ethically questionable methods to become his own master. Hunt goes on to classify Prospero as a, quote, political master with the natural right to enslave, end quote, but his political domination through supernatural art takes a toll on his morality. Prospero's regimented strata of life imitates subjects within an unscrupulous ruler's state, a circumstance bound to develop from self-aggrandizing and mass suppression. Even his daughter becomes a mere pawn to ensnare Ferdinand and make possible his ploy for justice in his extracted and insular universe. 
The slave master rhetoric permeates the play from beginning to end and echoes how medieval man's servitude to fortune and, and echoes medieval man's servitude to fortune's whims. When the audience is first introduced to Ariel, whom he uses to manipulate the nobles, the spirit begs for, quote, my liberty, and then asks prosperity, remember, I have done thee worthy service, told thee no lies, made no mistakings, served without grudge or grumblings. An enraged Prospero accuses Ariel of forgetting what he has saved him from, sounding like a slave master accusing his property of ingratitude as he cultivates a relationship of one-sided dependence. Quote, thou liest, malignant thing, thou, my slave, as thou reportest thyself. Prospero insists Ariel is indebted to him for pulling him from one hell and throwing him into another, and he warns Ariel not to deviate from his commands, or else, quote, if thou murmurest, I will rend an oak and peg thee in his naughty entrails till thou hast howled away twelve winters. Prospero has switched from acted upon to actor, and the cost to his probity is evident. Prospero has operated under both medieval and Renaissance modes of thought, but it is as an adherent to the latter that he is most in his element throughout the play. Hence, although in his former life he, for he enjoys mental solace by ignoring the temporal, he still voluntarily advocates rights to ducal comfort, <coughs> like exercising power and possessing tangible riches. Once he loses these conveniences, he realizes the effort he has put into acting as a servant to Fortuna would be better spent taking the necessary steps to gain control once again, and utilizes dukedom for his own benefit. He longs not just to be reinstated to his old position, but to affect an awareness in those who formerly mocked him, quote, that I am more better than Prospero, master of a full poor cell. His callousness has much to do with his, moreover Shakespeare's, knowledge that Renaissance humans were more open and susceptible to his influence than medieval generations. As Richard Streer explains, quote, the Renaissance was the first period in England in which there was a large-scale sense of human identity as open to both social and individual shaping. Shakespeare, as social critic that he was, took note of this malleability which explains why Prospero uses spectacles to fashion the owl in society into what he needs it to be, and in doing so, shapes himself into a ruler who despises powerlessness. Prospero lowers himself to a moral perigee as a pseudo-god, a Machiavellian ruler of the island. Instead of extending grace to the innocent and refusing to repay the iniquities of the father upon the son, Prospero shows no mercy toward Ferdinand who is an ideal depiction of innocence in the face of wrath, echoing how, quote, God apparently punishes some sinners on the will of fortune, Prospero punishes those who have sinned, as well as the offspring thereof, with magical afflictions, bringing them temporarily to a lower estate, an act of relegation Fortuna commits in perpetuity. As part of his plan to unite Ferdinand and Miranda, thus ensuring his reception back into the nobility, he directs Ariel to first sing the distraught air a jovial song, quote, allaying both their fury and my passion with its sweet air. Then, two lines later, Ariel sings a song aimed at exploiting Ferdinand's vulnerability in the wake of supposedly losing his father. Quote, full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made, these are pearls that were his eyes. All Ferdinand can do is accept the fate decreed by Prospero, the providential entity on the island, in the hopes of receiving favorable fortune later on. However, Prospero treats Ferdinand and the nobles not as humans, but on par with Ariel and Caliban, whom he considers property he can use in any way conducive to his needs. Quote, all manacle thy neck and feet together, sea water shalt thou drink, thy food shall be the fresh brook mussels, withered roots and husks. Mirroring his belligerent attitude toward the unhuman characters he treats as slaves, Prospero's violent threats subdue Ferdinand until the timing is apropos to show his and Miranda's love to the nobles. In the meantime, Ferdinand, quote, must remove some thousands of these logs and pile them up upon a sore injunction. Prospero forces Ferdinand into actual slave labor for two reasons. To keep him occupied until the nobles arrive, but also to trigger pity in his daughter. Because he orchestrates this scene of the suffering innocent, to, to his own advantage, Miranda and Mur Miranda, uh, Ferdinand and Miranda's uh, marriage is based more on Prospero's false construct of reality than true emotion. Prospero acts towards all, 
spirits, subhumans, nobles, and family with an otherworldly coldness. And it is his dictatorial nature that disconnects him from engaging with others on any level beyond manipulation. Just as Fortuna is depicted as blind and insensate, so Prospero's power through magic turns him away from his co-captains. The evidence mounted against Robert Reed's claim that, quote, Prospero's tempest restores and improves human nature abounds at all point, points after the storm. He has raised the tempest to provide a productive outlet for his aspirations, the pursuit of which highlights his moral decadence. His overt oppression of others with his mysterious forces is meant to show how magical power, Hunt says, impedes Prospero's spiritual development. Yet critics have interpolated an orthodox Christian ethics system into Prospero's psyche. Reed sees him as, quote, eth ethically immaculate and unlike previous Shakespeare protagonists who steadily decline in moral agency. It is interesting Reed selects the term moral agency because this is exactly what has been erased during Prospero's time on the island. The only human he has had contact with for 12 years is his daughter, whom he dwarfs with his esoteric intellectualism. Through his loss of contact with humans, he also loses the human value system guiding his morality, transforming him into a master with unlimited power and an emotive disconnect. He has no standard by which to measure his agency. His, his separation from human relationships is physical as well as emotional, however, because until the play is in, he does not interact with any of the adult nobles, only Ferdinand, who, like Miranda, is a mere lead sheep. Prospero ascribes his increasing distance of body and mind to the name of progress. For this material progress, regaining his position in society, he sacrifices empathy. The absence of empathy in Prospero becomes evident after he has transitioned from a medieval acceptor of Fortuna to the deified despot flourishing in the simulacrum of Renaissance society. Ironically, in his former state, before he was overthrown in exile, he had no more connection to humans than when everyone becomes a slave to him. Shakespeare suggests a certain naivete in medieval philosophy that separates the individual from the reality of human nature, desires, and self-centered. Because medieval man's focus was on heaven, his interactions with humans and understanding of them were skewed by unattainable virtues. Prospero explains how Antonio got the better of him, quote, as my trust was which had, indeed, no limit, a confidence sans bound. This ill-founded confidence in man's selflessness exemplifies his initial ignorance of human nature, while his exploitation of the same nature after his exile shows an equal disconnect with humans. Shakespeare critiques the extremities of each sociological framework by showing Prospero first as a, as a virtuous medieval man submissive to God's direction of Fortuna, and then as an intractable ruler bent on domination. Prospero's dual roles imply that, in both systems, losing connection with one's fellow humans is a prerequisite. In his paper linking Prospero to Renaissance despotism, Hugh Grady says, quote, Machiavellian politics embodied a new attitude of mastery and domination that would become crucial to the Western project of modernity. Acceding to an early modern model of Machiavellian rule, Prospero exercises power as he pleases, but only on the island, which Camilla Barker refers to as, quote, a microcosm of society. For this minuscule control, control, he trades in the morality he achieved while studying in Milan. But this is not to say his former state was any more beneficial to him as an individual. While in power, he chooses not to use it, a choice which gives him stripped of governance and then exile. Thus, the play presents the viewer with, to with the topoi for two competing philosophical frameworks and two outcomes. One can either abandon temporal power and successes in favor of virtue, or give up virtue for earthly pursuits. However, Prospero's embodiment of both modes of thought by no means suggests a balance. Although he serves as the fulcrum by which each view is critiqued, Prospero neither achieves the contentment medieval man sought, nor the unfettered mastery of self and state benefited befitting a Renaissance ruler. The play, however, does not end there. Prospero stuck at the polemical juncture where two idealistic existences meet. Act five creates a space between a ruler and slave in which Prospero can live. His encounter with the nobles near, Ariel describes the men he is deluded as, quote, brimful of sorrow and dismay, explaining how Gonzalo's tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Ariel, the unhuman, appears more affected by their woes than Prospero. Quote, 
Your charm so strongly works them that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. Prospero is shocked that a spirit, one whom he keeps as a slave, has more empathy for the humans he once mingled with. Quote, Dost thou think so, spirit? He asked. Furthermore, it is during this conversation that another change in Prospero becomes clear, as if the physical approach of humans reboots the emotions he has kept hidden with delusions of mastery. Quote, Hast thou which are but air, a touch, a feeling of their afflictions? And shall not myself, one of their kind, that relish all as sharply, passion as they, be kindly removed than thou art? He immediately defends himself as an empathetic human, more attuned to his own kind than area. And this defense sparks a desire not to rule, but rather to enter human normality, free from manipulating the lives of others through magic. At once, he gives up his control of spirits, whom he now deems, quote, weak masters, saying, this rough magic I hear abjure. He decides to, quote, break my staff, bury a certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book, his book of magic. He gives up controlling each of the inhabitants' forts through <coughs> magic and attempts, for the first time, to connect with others. He cannot, however, go back to living the contemplative life of a hermit, a life which left him equally as isolated. His compromise is one that encompasses and pairs away parts of medieval and Renaissance thinking. By, by putting away his magician's god, he has, quote, chased the ignorant fumes of his illusory, illusory control away and will allow the nobles to live using only their, quote, clear reason. Yet this reasoning is not a trickle-down virtue awarded for a life of submission. It is instead anthropogenic, a product of man embracing life without corrupting it through domination, a symbolic middle ground between the antithetical philosophies. Hence, Prospero's plea for applause in the epilogue becomes a plea for one to embrace his fellow man, neither ignoring nor controlling him but rather freeing him from those extremist thought processes that, quote, infest your mind and distract from the empathy Shakespeare saw as vital to true human progression. Quote, release me from my bands with the help of your good hands, Prospero says. Thus, in Prospero's transition from medieval acolyte to Renaissance ruler, both interpretive frameworks are fooled by one another, and a new man arises, stripped to his bare humanity. Thanks. Um, uh, essentially framed by this image. Um, it was, it started as um, a concept of looking at um, the etymology of three uh, words and concepts available and it, it became, a, the only way that I could make it work for myself was to draw it out. So um, this is sort of a visual representation of my argument. Um, so Beowulf, I'll just start with a little bit of an introduction is an old epic poem that follows its namesake um, through the heroic trials of his life. So Beowulf travels from his homeland um, to the land of the Danes, and there he helps the Danish king Hrothgar defend his hall against uh, the attacks of monsters. The epic fast forwards um, in the second half to the twilight of Beowulf's life, where he has become uh, the king of the Yates. And when a dragon threatens to burn the Yatish hall after he's awoken when someone has stolen treasure from his mound, um, Beowulf goes forth to fight the beast, um, even in his old age. And so though Beowulf kills the dragon, tragically he is also slain, leaving his kingdom leaderless. So the poem was written, or written down, it's very controversial, during a period of religious transitions of Anglo-Saxon and Britain. The age of the story of Beowulf is one that has filled scholarly journals for decades. Um, in fact, there was a presentation talking about it um, just this morning. And the Christianity or the paganism of the poem is often um, uh, hotly debated as a Christian uh, tale that has pagan flavoring, or as a you know pagan tale from the old tradition that's been um, you know adapted to um, an early Christian for an early Christian audience. So in the poem, Beowulf is treated as a hero, but scholars debate whether his heroic nature is laudatory and has earned him a Christian salvation or if the Anglo-Saxon culture of hero worship and pagan ritual is used simply to warn readers that a noble life is worth nothing if not lived in God's light. So scholars like F.A. Blackburn argue that Beowulf is essentially a pagan poem that a Christian scribe has colored with Christian imagery. Larry Benson and Frederick Faber both argue the opposite, 
stating that Beowulf is an early Christian poem that is dotted with a picturesque pagan ritual for added drama. So my study expands on Blackburn's argument that Beowulf cannot ascend to any Christian salvation because the poem is so essentially pagan that the Christian coloring of the scribe is mere wordplay. Where Blackburn examines the use of vocabulary uh, describing the Dreyfusen, or the Lord, or the Almighty, al the Almighty, I examine the use of the hall spaces in Beowulf as evidence of the pagan cosmology of the poem. So Bacon, uh, Bacon <coughs> offers insight into the Anglo-Saxon worldview, where the hall is the central image. It's the central image of creation, the life of men, and the afterlife. I argue that Beowulf is framed by the Anglo-Saxon hall in multiple layers, and that clear etymological links between the Old English words heaven, hell, and hall show the importance of the hall in Anglo-Saxon culture. And that Beowulf has no hope of transit, transcending the Anglo-Saxon cosmology into a Christian one, no matter the wordplay of the scribe. So the hall is the one of the central images in Anglo-Saxon Anglo poems. And at the heart of Anglo-Saxon, <coughs> the hall is where the Nordman lived. Um, that's where his people clustered around its walls for protection and companionship. Um, other Old English elegies, like the Wanderer, the Seafarer, and the Ruin, lament the disconnection from Hall companions, equating it with exile and punishment. The Hall is where a king accumulated his treasures and gifted them to his saints, his most loyal followers. It was also a place of treachery and doom, where hoarded treasures attracted the hate of both men and monsters. In Beowulf, the Hall acts as a descriptor for both heaven and hell, and occasionally a single Hall, like Harawad, which is the heart of um, Beowulf, can be heaven and hell simultaneously. The locations of heaven and hell flip and turn as the poem progresses. So Anglo-Saxons are of, <laughs> as the poem progresses. So Anglo-Saxons who are of a Nordic descent brought their pagan beliefs from the continent when they settled England. The Nordic cosmology privileges this hall motif. There are nine realms within the cosmos, and each one of those nine realms has a central hall-type location. The most interesting feature of the Nordic universe is that all the realms are connected either by a road or the sea. Hell and Asgard, uh, which you can see um, if you have a handout in the small box here, uh, represents Asgard, uh, Agarville, and um, Hell at the bottom, are actually connected uh, directly by a road. Uh, now, in this two-dimensional representation, they are above Midgard, which is Earth, and below Midgard. But in other representations, they are actually can be turned to the side or they can be flipped at the inverse. So um, they're not exclusively connected um, you know, in an upper plane and a lower plane the way that we conceive of the Christian heaven and hell as being connected to the realm of men. So a warrior who passes from Midgard must travel through hell on his way to Valhalla, the hall of Odin, where he resides in the afterlife. Warriors who pass um, on their way to Valhalla can choose to remain in Helheim to serve the goddess Hell, and in North mythology, this is not considered a punishment or a purgatory. In Beowulf, heaven and hell are not always positioned relative to the horizon, but rise and fall the way the sky falls over the earth. Hell can rise from the underworld and occupy the spaces of men, the waters of the ocean, or even the sky. In turn, the hell spaces of the poem, Grendel's Battle Hall, the dragon's barrow, the ocean, all of those places can be cleansed of the evil that resides there, recreating these halls as heavenly or heroic spaces. The English words heaven, hell, and hall are all derived from a single PIE root, hell, which means to conceal or to cover. The OED defines hall as a large place covered by a roof. In the same vein, the OED defines hell as a dwelling place of the dead or the abode of departed spirits. Hell, like hall, is a dwelling covered by a roof. The OED defines heaven as the expanse in which the sun, moon, and stars are seen, regarded as having the appearance of a vast vault over the earth, the sky, or the firmament. Uh, the firmament is also another word used to describe the earth, creating another layer of connection between the earth and the heavens. The heavens cover the earth much like a roof of a hall covers and conceals the interior of a building. The OE, the OE um, Old English word cross, meaning roof, is often used as, as a synonym for sky and makes up compounds that describe Herod's roof, Grendel's hall roof, and the roof of the dragon's barrow. The cosmos of Beowulf is first framed by a hall built on the legacy of the Danish king, Shield Shepi. The poem opens with the burial of the great king. 
The king is laid to rest in a ship, depicted here, where the whole is laden with various treasures and weapons. The ritual itself is quite pagan. Ship burials were common in Norse uh, culture. The most famous evidence of Norse funerary rituals in England was obtained from the Sutton Hoo Cemetery Mounds. There, a very important person, perhaps a king, was laid to rest in a grave where the whole of a grounded ship formed the floor and walls of the chamber. The ship was then covered by a mounding of dirt. The curve of Shield Shepping's burial ship forms the floor and the walls of the poem. The bosom of the ship, or the hole, as it is, that is defined in Middle English, is etymologically linked to heaven and hell. Hole is a derivative of the same uh, Proto-Indo-European Proto root, kelp. The hull of the ship covers the occupants and shelters them from the encroaching water in the same way that the hull roof protects the occupants from the sky. In fact, looking at Nordic mead halls on the continent, most surviving halls have arched roofs that mimic the hull of their Viking longships. The arched roofs of the Anglo-Saxon halls look as though they are ships riding on the vast expanse of the sky a mirror image of a ship floating on open sea. Uh, Beowulf um, the, actually quotes, um, in its bosom lay many treasures, so in the bosom of the ship. The poem is bordered on the other side <coughs> of the heavens, where the last physical mention of Beowulf is made. By definition, Heophon, the, the heavens, is a vast vault over the earth. After the dragon poisons Beowulf, his body is burned, and the smoke rises from his pyre to the sky. A single line, Heofan Reche Swayo, tells us that the heaven swallowed the smoke. Beowulf translator Laiutza, in his introduction to the poem, makes a point to comment on the pagan image of this last line. Um, that if that is something that uh, gives Beowulf divine favor, that is a strikingly pagan image. Uh, the line uses the word Heofan, heaven, defines the roof over the earth, whose roof means to cover and conceal. So in this reading, heaven acts as a body, a space that consumes and internalizes the symbolic remains of the hero's modus, his soul. Um, <clears throat> Beowulf is thus symbolically turned back into the realm of the Norse cosmos by the overarching vault of the sky, denying him an exit from his pagan cosmology. The Hall of Heorot is the most prominent hall in Beowulf's history. <coughs> the hall stands high and horn-gabled, a monument to the power of the Danish king Hrothgar, and a place that resembles the heavenly hall of Valhalla. <clears throat> Herat stands under heaven's gleaming dome, as described by the poem, illustrating that heaven enclosed the world of the poem. The great mead hall is at the heart <clears throat> of the manuscript, and it is described as a hall without measure, full of gold and warriors. Inter interestingly, Herat means stag, whose synonym, heart, H-A-R-T, is phonically linked to the heart of the body. Of the body. To say that Herat is the heart of the poem is not too far off the mark. Herat acts as a microcosm for the whole cosmos of epic. The space <coughs> embodies, uh, embodies the heavens, its vaulted roof echoing the vault of the sky. Yet in the very same stanza where the virtues of Herat are de detailed, in the midst of the same verse even, the hull is alight with the fire of treachery and treason looking into the future. He should order a hall building which the sons of men should remember forever, the greatest of halls, towered high and horn gabled. It awaited hostile fires, the surges of war. The time was not yet at hand when the sword hate of sworn in-laws should arise after ruthless violence. This dichotomy illustrates the containment of the cosmos within the poem, showing that the location of heaven and hell are not relative to the horizon, but can be contained and concealed in the same space simultaneously. In direct reflection of Herod stands Grendel's battle hall. The battle hall is concealed by a mirror, which is covered by fire. <coughs> the fiery water acts as the sky, or the Nifsela, which stands for deep hall. The sky of the mirror is tied to the heavens themselves, where synonyms for sky like Vulcan and Rodar are derived from the Proto-Indo-European -Indo root meaning water. The flames over the mirror represent the sun, which finds its home in the heavens. The battle hall is protected by a cross cella, or hall roof, that keeps the waters of the mirror from flooding into the hold, in exactly the same way that the hull of the ship keeps the ocean waters at bay. After Beowulf kills Grindel and his mother, the battle hall is cleansed of the monster's evil and becomes a space of heroic triumph, even though it resides below the surface of the poem. The great hall of the poem is also directly mirrored in the dragon's pharaoh, where Beowulf meets his end. 
And the barrow is described as a vast stone vault, where stone arches and sturdy pillars held up the inside of that ancient hall. Like Grendel, the dragon rises from the barrow and transfers hell to the sky. He lights the sky with pillars of fire. The dragon is called Nithraka, translated <coughs> as hostile dragon. <coughs> can also mean deep, and it is the same word used to describe Grendel's battle hall, linking the two spaces of the poem. The Nordic dragon, Nithrog, lives in the realm of hell, chewing on the roots of the tree of life, which resides in Asgard. Both dragons reside below the realm of men, but are connected to the sky. Beowulf's dragon takes joy in flight, and because the dragon thrives on flight, the barrow, a stony vault, acts as both a hall and, in some aspects, as the heavens. Like the mirror, Beowulf's heroic act cleanses the barrow of the evil of the dragon, even though the barrow becomes his tomb. The world of Beowulf is contained and concealed within the confines of a roof. The world above and the world below are always described as covered by vaulted roofs, by clouds, by earth, by water, and even by fire. The halls of Beowulf are connected and intertwined by the language used to describe them. The connectedness of the hall world words and their ability to turn and morph from trust trustworthy to treacherous creates a rhetorical framework work in Beowulf that defines the boundaries of the poem and gives insight into the culture that created it. As evidence in the construction of the poem, Beowulf is framed in multiple layers by halls, and those hall frames turn from heaven to hell, much like the sky and its heavenly bodies turn and fall on the horizon like a wheel turns on a hub. Unlike contemporary Christian ideas of heaven and hell, which assert that heaven is above and hell is below, heaven and hell and Beowulf are multi-directional. Beowulf ultimately represents a self-contained world within a manuscript, and so that's why I'm looking at, um, needed to draw this out in, in this sort of a sphere. Uh, <clears throat> the poet's ability to represent the hall as both heaven and hell illustrates this and deepens the troubled concept of the hero of the hero's salvation within the epic. If Hera, Hrothgar's Hall, the Barrow, the burial ship, the mirror, the ocean, and the sky all contain and conceal, conceal heaven and hell, then the hope of the hero's eternal salvation is limited only to the physical world as described by the poet and the Nordic cosmology embedded in the language of the poem. When the smoke of Beowulf's ashes rises to the sky, there it's trapped by the vaulted arches of, of the firmament. In the same way that the firelight within Grindel's battle hall is contained by the pillar roof and covered by the firm of the tree with the mirror. If heaven and hell are halls, and the hall is both heaven and hell, then there's no life beyond those quarters, and the Christian glazing on top of the pagan epic is reduced to wordplay. So the quotes here on the four panels are, this building stands most excellent under heaven <coughs> and then the stone arches and sturdy pillars are held up the inside of that ancient earth hall. And in the bosom of the ship lay its many treasures. And then when Maywolf dies, and then swallows the smoke. Thank you. Um, this is for Desiree. Um, uh, I was intrigued by your discussion about uh, the cosmology of heaven and hell uh, and how it comes originates in uh, Norse uh, cosmology. Um, it, because, you know, the same idea comes up a lot of different places, um, which is very intriguing, it's sort of a collective unconscious. Uh, um, how much uh, do you think that? You know, like the ancient Greeks may have had an influence on it. Do you think that that's possible, or? Uh, I'm not sure. That's a really good question. Um, in in my research for you know this particular project, um, the the Norse cosmology is very complicated. I, there are I think I way oversimplified it with the nine realms and their halls, but um, I'm not really sure of like their exact in, influence because I didn't kind of go down that whole rabbit hole to trace mm -hmm. it all the way yeah. <laughs> to find out where those nine how that. Cosmology originated. <coughs> Plato talks about an underworld. He yes. And yeah. The concepts, I mean, I think the concepts are very universal. But I think what's unique about the Norse cosmology is that, you know, while the vocabulary sort of says underworld or it's, you know, the, the um, you know, they use words like deep, it's not really under. Uh, they don't really describe it as under anything, but it's just very deep. 
Mm -hmm. you know, which means, you know, maybe it goes, it goes a long way up or down. But in the uh, Norse cosmology, it's a spiral. So like, it's constantly, the nine realms sort of constantly move in like this weird infinity symbol of motion so that hell can be above Midgard, you know, the, the middle, the main realm of man at any point in their you know, sort of, you know, history. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting, looking at the vocabulary, how the vocabulary is used and the phrasing uses, used in the Old English, that those two, the deep and the sky and the depths of the underworld are sort of interchangeable, are very interchangeable. And the sky itself is described as deep, hmm. deep on occasion. So um, they don't really see the two things as being, as, as sort of a metaphor for good and evil, the sky and the underworld is, mm -hmm. as denoting, you know, being good or evil. Mm -hmm. And I saw some of that in your paper as well, combined with the big one for the paper this morning. Um, just the idea of, uh, of what you're talking about, this classical concept of um, seeking the glory and honor and fame, and how does right. that work, and that conflicting with what you talked about, this idea of this Christian, well, how does that then articulate with Christian moral values? Right. Right, so it's, 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 I think it's interesting, but I, I see what you're talking about there. Well, the, and it, it actually, it, it falls in line with your paper, the comitatus is, you know, yeah. was the old, you know, the, you know, high Germanic or, you know, the Anglo-Saxon idea of, of loaf or fame or pride. That was how they, uh, that was sort of their measure of their personhood or their measure of their success yeah. as a great, as a warrior team of their, you know, sort of um, warrior culture. You know, that it's the brotherhood, loyalty of the hall, brotherhood and your integrity or you know, ferocity of a, as a warrior yeah. was you know like the measure of their um, of their value which is you know what Brian was talking about this morning too um, not a direct correlation to the Christian like the early Christian ideals of, yeah. of faith and reverence as being you know the measure of your salvation so, mm -hmm. interesting See, we managed to bridge the gap here. Exactly, there we go. Yeah. Beowulf Shakespeare. Yeah. Of question for Desiree. So, in Beowulf, there's two authors in the beginning. You have the death of a, a good, good king shielding, and then the other death of the good king Beowulf, like, you know, framing the story. Do you, do you think the uh, differences in the funeral for one sunk in a ship, it looks like, and one's burned on a pier, uh, pyre? Mm -hmm. Do you think those are just two different authors, different opinions on how Germanic uh, funeral should go, or do you think those commentary on something on a religious nature? Um, I'm not sure if it's commentary on religious nature, just because I'm skeptical of of the religious, like the religious intentions of the scribe. You know, like there's a lot of debate, and I, like I said, I'm going to read your paper so I can sort of uh, maybe make a more definitive decision. But I think that um, th the two sort of correlate each other, which in a really interesting visual way. If you think about um, the whole of the ship of Shield, and he, you know, sort of departs to an unknown place, in which actually I have it marked where he says. Um, men do not know who, how to truly say, not trusted counselors, no heroes under the sky, who received that cargo. So the, the, the ship is, you know, sort of floated out into the, into the ether and disappears and no one knows where it went. It's sort of the same concept of Beowulf being burned in the pyre, but it's the opposite, you know, it's sort of, the barrow forms like this really interesting arch where the hole sort of you know, forms the base of that. And then his soul or his modus like rises with ashes into the unknown. The heavens swallow it, and it dis it dissipates um, without really any um, ending up anywhere. So I think that it's a, the frame in that way is really interesting, and that it closes the shape of the poem as well. So I don't know if that's really, you know, I don't know if that ties together. Any, like I have to do a little more research on, you know, that to see. If I think there's a little simplification. Can I jump into that for a minute? The, unless the translations are, are weird, I, I read the same one you do. No one knows who found, and not whether someone found this cargo. So there's an assumption that at some point someone found this, discovered it, and it has been, you know, so it's, yeah, the smoke yeah, may go up and we don't yeah, know, but we yeah, know that this has gone out and we don't know <laughs> who found it, not, not whether someone found it. So that's, I always talk right, about that in our class. And, and there's some other interesting, there's a, I have a bibliography if anybody wants it. There's a couple of um, um, critics who uh, assume that, that the treasure and shield shepping ship, shield shepping ship, that's it, <laughs> and, um, okay. and the treasure and the barrow are related. Uh -huh. So that, you know, technically, 
the, the who that found it or the whether it was found is is sort of negated in those two treasure spaces because both of those treasures are essentially useless because no one reaps the benefit of Shield Sheffing being buried with his treasure while Bale is also buried with treasure that is rusted and worthless as well um, at the very end of the poem. So, um, so essentially the dragon's treasure was found by man. It was found by man, just as we assume that Shield Sheffing's treasure was found, but it, it didn't yield anything for it. Now I think about the wanderer, you know, who, who leaves behind uh, the whole civilization and everything's buried and lost again and no one benefits. And right. um, the same, over and over again we find the same motif. Why do men bother accumulating all this stuff when ultimately, you know? <laughs> yeah. I have a comment for it, Jesse Ray. I uh, really like the idea that you're going back to proto-Indo-European and looking yeah. at the reflexes of the, of the words that, that we got from, from Gail. Um, just, just in addition, I'm looking at your uh, at your um, illustration here, and wheel is another derivation yeah. from from Gale. So you probably yeah, have that there. So wheel, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, essentially, I guess my wheel is really like my it's, it's really the axis, like yes. because it does. Yeah. It, to me, it looks like the whole narrative really goes like this and like this. So it's, Rotates. Well, it's that concept of wheel in the, the nine spheres moving as well. This this move, predictable Very movement, spherical. you know. Do we have other questions, comments? If not, then thank you very much. Okay.